Hey, this is Scott Smith, and uh, welcome to another Saturday message. I've been facetiously calling these Saturday services, uh, and it's sticking for me, so I'm going to stay with that. Um, this has been a very hard week. Um, our most beloved and my most treasured friend uh, and dog, Trixie, who was born in 2008, we've had since 2009, passed away. She left us on Wednesday. We woke up in the morning. Um, we'd had a nice late night walk. She woke me up then and we woke up in the morning and she was gone. Um, so it's been a very hard week. Um, as you can probably imagine, especially if you have had a dog um, for any significant period of time and understand the unconditional love that comes from these lovely little beings that are with us and the short time they are with us uh, how much uh, that can really hurt to lose them um, so Brandon my partner and I have been really experiencing a lot of grief and uh, sort of reorienting ourselves in this life now without her because uh, she's been with us for 15 and a half almost 16 years of the 21 years that we've been together so it's uh, a significant portion of our relationship is absent um yeah so uh, forgive me if i uh shed a few tears during this i think i'm good um i i but if i do i i have no regrets for it i just wanted to preface with that today so i wanted to talk about <clears throat> a couple of things today um, the inevitability of things like loss to bounce off the message from last week which really had a lot to do with life and death wasn't that a poignant message for me I want to say to myself and the tarot and to say that the tarot means something and sometimes the tarot really means something um, I think that those are the three things that I want to cover today so um, I'm going to feel into that for a moment and just say that I knew that Trixie was not going to be with us forever in the physical. She, her body was not going to be here because dogs don't live that long. Um, and I love and adore her. She was my favorite person. Um, and I miss her soft little grunts and her licks and the sound of her paws on the floor. Uh, we have hardwood floors as she walked around, the soft tap of her nails. All of these were a large part of the texture of sound and physicality of where I live. This was part of the intimate love energy of where we're at. But this doesn't last forever. You know, uh, this too shall pass, right? Um, these energies were there. Last week when I was in Sacramento and um, I had gone to the uh, historic Sacramento graveyard in the center of um, town, uh, I had a very strong sense of that intertwining of life and death and I had talked about that and mentioned it on the Instagram posts with the you know the blooming flowers and you know the hundred and more year old tombstones. Um, and grave sites there, that this was an intertwining of that energy, and that really had a lot to do with witchcraft for me. Um, because witchcraft does have that embrace of life, and embracing life is death. So these things sort of intertwine together. Uh, they're part of the same, you know, experience. Um, I didn't know that that message would be so relevant for me. I didn't know that it was going to be so true, uh, so true in a way I could not see. Um, what do we do when this happens? You know, how do we handle this? A lot of people reached out uh, when I made the post on Instagram and on Facebook about the loss of Trixie. And a lot of well-intended pieces of advice came through and I, you know, I embrace it all. I'm not going to be insulted by anybody or, uh, you know, it's, I understand what is motivating people is to help someone through loss and there is no insult in that. It's absolutely okay. And I embrace that. 
it brought discomfort, it brought up a lot of tears, but you know, I understand that people really mean well when they're when they're when they're sending these messages. For me in this experience, this is not a philosophy when I say that, you know, maybe I should rephrase that, but it's not a philosophy to say, it's not, it's not ideological for me to say that, like, I feel love and I feel loss at the same time because death is inevitable. It's not something that's lofty or high. I mean, that's something in my heart. This is something that I feel and know and live because my philosophies, my spiritualities are not something that I just do one day a week or only when I need them, but these are things that I get up and think and breathe and live in, in this body, in myself, in this world, full of all the spirits of everything that was and is and the potential for it to be. We're all in this coil, this spiral, this dance of energies that is uh, life and death and then return in maybe a new way, right? Um, so it's not just an ideological thing. It's not like, oh, well, I'm embracing this philosophy to get myself through this moment. I'm very much in this moment. I very much feel what's happening. So my message there, my thought there is these things are happening every day. We've gone through a tremendous experience collectively of grief and loss, or loss and now grief. And so these things happen. And we're here with those feelings and emotions. And they're powerful. And there's really not anything that we can do to stop them, per se. You know, we might find ways to buffer ourselves or to drown them out. And I think that sometimes that's okay too, you know, so long as it's not self-destructive. My friend Leslie, uh, back in 1998, when I had lost uh, my boyfriend at the time, Sean Moyer, uh, who was a, a student at um, Norman University in Oklahoma. Uh, there's a program there in his name. Um, uh, when he passed away, you know, I did some things that weren't precisely healthy, and I'm not advocating doing unhealthy things when I say this, but they were things that actually made me feel alive. And she had reframed that for me because I was feeling bad, you know, that I was going out so much, I was dancing so much, I was in my 20s, but you know, like I was uh, drinking every night and all these sorts of things that you do, you know, uh, when you're that age and, and maybe you have access to that, but <clears throat> you know, I'd said I felt bad about it. And she said, while it may be true that this is not something that's good for you right now, it's life affirming and you need that life affirmation with this kind of loss. I'm not there. I'm not doing that now. I have my practice now. I understand my interior world very well and my relationship to the world around me. And so I have a means to communicate that. I have a means to sit with it. When these waves of grief wash over me, you know, I have a way to do that. And, and it's predominantly meditation, but it's not necessarily through the meditation directly. It's just through the practice of meditation as I've developed it over time, which is, you know, it's a little bit of witchcraft. It's a little bit of paganism. It's connecting to the earth and the, and the spirits of, of what is, but also mindfulness. You know, it draws in a lot of that mindfulness I love Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Ram Das, and you know they've all influenced me in many ways. Thich Nhat Han, uh, His Holiness the Dal His Holiness, excuse me, the Dalai Lama, all of these people have affected me over the years and had me uh, or caused me to consider the way that I handle things in my own mind. And I think that's one of the many benefits of Buddhism is the ability to understand that a lot of this experience that we're happening, uh, we can look at it mindfully. Um, but how do we how do we how do we really handle it? You know, like where does what happens when we hit darkness? You know, uh, my friend Chris says, you know, when we when we hit darkness, we um, our character is revealed, right? Our character is revealed when we hit that darkness. And I really he said that to me during the pandemic, and that really stuck with me. So I feel sorrow, grief, and loss, and I also feel love and connection. 
in continuity, like I feel going forward. And these are simultaneous things inside of me. They're things that exist at the same time. So the first part of the message is, is that this happens and this will happen. Um, it, it is part of the great mystery of life. And we, however we see it, will be there when it happens. And that's not a dire or a sour or a sad message because we have the beauty of this moment and of this day and of this time together uh, to make the best of it. You know, as Ram Dass says, we're all walking each other home. You know, um, at the Wadruna concert that I went to, you know, he, uh, the singer had said that, you know, he sang the song at the end about singing, uh, singing us home or singing us away when we pass. And I, and I think that it's just a reminder right now that, you know, this life really is something miraculous that we don't see anywhere else. And to know it, we have the opportunity to really love it, even when we're going through the horrible things. And I'm going through that horrible thing right now. So I just wanted to share that message with you, uh, that part of things, because that's an important uh, piece to talk about. Um, <clears throat> I pulled tarot today. Um, I think I'm sticking to my message. I pulled the tarot today and I'm using the tarot of the spirit. Um, this one's by Pamela Eakins. Um, I actually have had this particular deck since 1994. Um, and in the beginning, there's an instruction. Uh, it's a, oh, that's right. She, she even signed this copy. Thank you, Pamela, if you watch this. Um, uh, in the beginning, there's an instruction of meditating on the tarot to learn them. And I started doing this in 94, so it's 2024. Um, and I read that instruction at the start, which said something to meditate on the cards, to make a little altar for yourself, to write your notes, put the book aside. And I was like, oh, and I put the book aside. I put this big old book aside and I was like, I'm not going to look at it. And I just started meditating on the cards and writing my notes. Had I been a little less enthusiastic and a little bit more focused on the detail, I would have realized that it was recommended to do it for like one to three days, each card. But I stuck it out. So it took me six years to meditate on this particular tarot deck. And I started in Newark, California, and it went with me through uh, most of California, Los Angeles, San Francisco. It went with me to Guatemala, where I lived in uh, Xelahu, or Quetzaltenango. Uh, it went with me to New York City, and it came with me back to Los Angeles, where I completed that journey. It was quite, um, it was quite a journey, uh, that, that, that process of things. But I learned a lot about the cards. Later, I read the book. I went back and I read the book, and I compared them to my own reflections on the tarot. And I saw that my understanding of what was in the image was similar to what the written message was. Um, I noticed this week that a lot of people were talking about tarot, you know, it's, um, it's tarot day, you know, it's national tarot day. Like it's, it's been coming up and, you know, as it does on social media, there was a lot of argument about intuitive tarot and do you need to know the cards and do you need to not know the cards and do you just trust your intuition and all of those sorts of things. And I think yes is the answer because it is very helpful to know what the cards mean because it is a fixed system of divination, meaning that it has specific meanings that mean certain things because it is the tarot. And... It is the mirror of soul. It represents a reflection of what's going on in our life. And so while the card may have a meaning, it also has a personal meaning, right? I talked about those four truths before. You know, ways in which things mean something on one level may mean something different on another level. What may be true on the mythic level or the universal level may not be true on a personal level, or it might be in a way that's different but it's not necessarily going to be true on like a relative, like, you know, gravity, atomic level, you know, physicality level. Like sometimes truths are different, but the tarot has meaning, right? It's designed with the meaning in mind so that we know when we pull that card, it generally means a certain thing. So it's super important to know what the cards are. However you learn that, 
Uh, however you figure that out and whatever your method of learning that is, then do that. You know, understand the meaning of the cards. But speaking from experience, I didn't use this well-written, wonderful, amazing book until after I had gone through the cards. I used the cards as a mirror of the soul. I saw myself as the fool moving through the tarot deck. I shuffled it all up and I, and I, um, oh, actually I take that back. I put it in order. I went fire, water, air, earth, and the major arcana. And I went through all of those cards, uh, sometimes weeks at a time meditating on the same card until the message was made clear to me. Until I felt intuitively I knew what that card meant. So when I see these cards, when I pull the levers, I know what that means. But the cards also mean something specifically for the time that we are in and the kinds of energies we are experiencing. So when I pull the levers today and I see this sword between these two folks in the card, I understand what Pamela means when she says this is the sword of Zane that separates, that this energy is what cuts, right? It leaves a wound. But the energy of the card is how we can come together what solace can we bring in that togetherness? How can we put our arms around each other in the best, most unfettered and loving way to bring in that spirit of love? Because that's, a, that's an important message of what the lovers can be. You know, like in the Pamela Smith, the Rider Waite deck, you know, uh, the lovers has that angel in the card. It represents that third force in the experience of the two, which is love. Uh, hopefully it's got that influence of agape, that higher love to it, but it may also be physical. It may also be whatever, you know, uh, different kinds of love, but it ultimately it represents the spirit of love. In a lot of ways, that spirit of love was Trixie for us in our in our relationship. She was that person who was with us for so long that she represented that. So when I see that card, I go, oh, yeah, the sword that separates. The second card that I pulled was the nine of wands or the nine of fire. And she writes that as the eye of fire, which I have always saying eye of the tiger when I see this card because it just has that dun, 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 dun kind of energy to it. Um, the Eye of Fire, I was reflecting on this card through the B tarot, you know, um, the, the the Nine of Wands in that particular tarot deck has like a busted, burning beehive. While this card can reach and mean like a kind of pinnacle experience, right, and wands represent fire and power. Um, <clears throat> some people might argue air, but that's not where we're at here. Um, it can also mean an ending or a completion of something. Before we move on to that number 10, which is a one and a zero, things have been zeroed out and we're starting something new, 10. It's that beginning again. Um, you know, it's the magician and the fool in a lot of ways, the one and the zero, um, or it's the 10, the wheel of fortune, right? Like it's, it, there's those little mirrors there for us to think about. It says that we've gone through a process and that process has come to a completion. So what does that mean in the bigger picture for the lovers, right? Like what does that mean for you and anyone that you're going through loss with or have gone through loss with? Like, yeah, that happened, but where is the spirit of return or what is the spirit that helps you to return um, or part? You know, what is it that you need? You know, but for me, I'm framing it in my experience while the levers and the nine mean these sorts of things, this is what it specifically means for my experience, is what I wanted to say. And the final card that I pulled was the uh, Father of Wind. This has a very Gemini influence to it, if you see that card there. Um, I think it's uh, Taurus and Gemini. Um, the court cards represent aspects of our own development. They represent where we're at in the attainment of our realization of soul and what we're doing and who we are as an identity of the world. 
I like to count through the court cards when I see a page. This may represent a child if we're talking about family and children come up in a reading, but it can also represent someone who knows something about something. They've already gone through the one in 10 and the pages go, oh, I know this bit, right? They may not know everything, but they know something. They're not the knights, right? The knights represent that cavalier energy, this going out and doing something about it. They're kind of journeymen, right? Like the apprentices, the one who goes along with someone and learns something. That's the page. The knights are someone who now have a charge and they go out and they do it. They're gonna go out in the world and they're gonna, they're gonna work, they're gonna create, they're gonna protest, they're gonna do the thing that they're gonna do. Queens and kings, right? These don't necessarily represent gendered uh, individuals, right? They represent aspects. The queens usually represent like where we feel the knowingness or advice, the understanding when I read it, queen, about what it is that the knights and the pages and the numbers mean and what's the best like sort of like way to know what we need to do or the direction that we need to go with them. And the kings sort of represent the uh, experienced advice where the queen is I think some sort of experiential more more full encompassing of the whole of the physical experience the kings can really represent elements of it so when I look at that I see the swords air so the mind and intellect and the swords are very ideological they represent thoughts about things or ideological stances and when I see the father wind this is someone who's already gone through having hard opinions um, has already come through very fixed ideas and has come to the place, this is that Gemini and Taurus energy, where they understand they can be softer about the way things go and about the way that they're thinking about, right? So the three messages together for me say, oh, Scott, right? You know, uh, how do you come together through this moment of tragedy? And what's the, the best way that you can work together? And I, and I really like the duality of of the lovers repeating in the father wind, this dark and light energy that you see there, the Gemini energy and the horse or the bull, excuse me, and getting it to move forward. You know, how does that come together? Uh, how do two hands direct the way forward? So the, the other part of the message is that the meaning of things that we see. I wanted to gather my thought there. The meaning of things that we see, see in the world, that we experience in the world, are going to have different expressions of whatever the influence is that's happening for us. Happiness, sadness, death, learning, transition, traveling, all of these things show up in the tarot, right? And they're written on the cards, so to speak, illustrated, but they also mean something personal, right? They mean something to us that shapes the real meaning of the message in there. What have we lost? What have we let go? Reflecting on how we've come together around that. What was the spirit that really brought us back together and did we call that in? And whether that was with ourselves and our dual mind about something, you know, like maybe we want to do this, maybe we want to do that, maybe we argue with ourselves, or whether that was with someone else. How did we come together with a goal, a vision? How do we communicate together? How did we step forward in the spirit of that unity towards what's next? We're in a really divisive time. We're in a great changing time. How does this message reflect for you this week? Because this too shall pass. What I like to do, and I'm gonna close with this today, what I like to do is this. When something is happening, which is very emotional for me, I like to breathe, I like to feel my feet, I like to feel my body, I like to recenter myself back into the space. And I ask myself, what's happening? 
that may be overwhelming. So I might use some method to really refocus back on myself. But if I can, I like to write what's happening. Who's involved? What's happening? I write that in my journal. I look that that's a subjective interpretation, that that's a personal interpretation of what's happening here. So I try to like go through that writing and say like this objectively, like regardless of my opinions, these are the only things that happened and this is the only things that were said or this is the only things that occurred. That's oftentimes different because a lot of emotionality goes into what's happening to us and we might color our experience with that. So it's good for me to sort of just see the moving parts of it. Just this, this, and this. Okay. Okay. How do I feel about that? I feel, and then I write. And I might see something in that statement and I go, I feel. And I just keep writing, I feel, and I write those things out until I land on what it is I really feel. I feel loss. I feel love. I feel... Trixie, right? When I understand how I feel, I have a very clear idea about what's shaping my experience because this is what's coloring everything that I see. The subjective objective, the internal external, these things that are dancing back and forth with each other. This is sort of what's making up my experience. I write, I think. And I write what I think is happening. And I write, I believe. Sometimes I write, I believe, or I fear, or both. Just to really look at what all those thoughts are. This helps me to really understand the contents of what's happening for me. And I can create a clearer picture for myself of what's next. And I'll have clients do this sometimes too. Like, what, what is it that's happening? How do you feel? What do you believe to be true? What do you know is true? Do you not? Well, what can we do about that? What's the next thing that we can do? We can engage practices or energy work or things to help us feel or remediate some of those feelings if it's too intense, shut some things down if it's too intense, or open us up if we're ready. But to really understand the parts and the processes that we're going through, right? That's a very important thing to do. And as a reminder, as I close this, this social media experience is designed to monitor your behavior and amplify the things that you are touching, tapping, and viewing. And if what you're experiencing in your social media is overwhelming you, Take a break. If what you're experiencing in your social media is not doing you healthy, take a break. Do a media detox. My non-therapeutic, non-professional advice, just as a human in the world, right? You have to make your own decisions for yourself. That's your responsibility, not mine. But I think the thing that we need to amplify and that I read in these cards today is our connection to each other, is our connection to what we feel and to ourselves and understand the spirit that's influencing us and how best we can work in this moment for all things change. There is a spirit of love that is available to us. And I hope that this message guides you to find that so that you can find your best direction for yourself. Step back. Step back from those people prophesying and spooking you with scary dreams and bad messages and there's enough of that that's really happening in the world without going to someone who's elevating a very hyped out, fearful, 
paranoid, destructive message. Find love. Remember the lovers. Remember this experience. And find the way that we can come together around it with your folks, with yourself. And love them. Love them all. Thanks for watching. This is Scott K. Smith. This is The Terror of the Spirit by Aunt Pamela Eakins. Um, you can find out more about me through my company, which is Star and Stone LLC.com. You can also find me on patreon.com slash Scott K. Smith. I usually capitalize the S, the K, the S in my name. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and everywhere else. Uh, I appreciate your likes, uh, your love, and your follows. Thanks for all the new follows this week, by the way. Um, I noticed that uh, for the first time I had new followers on my YouTube channel, so that's so nice. Um, yeah. We're all walking each other home, right? We're all in this together, right? So let's make the best of it.